Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV and the trio of shows we have for you this week before we break for the new year and then back again the following week. So we are continuing our look at the Battle of the Bulge. And this one is also about the Battle of the Bulge, but also harks back for those of you who are with the channel when we did a week on the medical units back in whatever that was. And we talked about some other stuff in the Pacific. We had some great shows. We talked about the aid stations with Reg Jans in the Ardennes uh, for the 101st. We talked about um, Red Berets and Red Crosses with uh, Neil Cherry and Arnhem. So I like talking about medical services. As you know, those of you who are fans of mine or fans of the channel, the book I wrote, uh, Angels of Mercy, was about medics in Angervillo plan on D-Day. So it's a, a subject that's close to my heart. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my guest. And I like, as you know, bringing you the very famous published authors like Peter Caddick Adams. But I also really love bringing you the people who are what I call the the amateur historians. I don't mean that in any kind of negative way, but it's those people out there who've been studying something for a long, long time. Perhaps they run a website or Facebook group and their passion, their enthusiasm for their subject harks through. And that's what we have for you today. Uh, Rainier Groeneveld is a Dutch doctor and amateur historian. He has spent the last X number of years talking about the 4th Armour Division and their medical baton. So without further ado, I shall bring him in. So good evening. How are you? Good evening, Paul. I'm excellent. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. So, as I ask most people, um, you know, you, you're 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 a doctor by trade, a family doctor, a general practitioner in the Netherlands. But where did your interest in looking at the uh, medical procedures of World War Two uh, start, and why particularly the Fourth Armored Division? Um, well, it, it actually started when I, I got my jeep. I um, was uh, sort of afflicted by um, the green virus uh, through my uh, my. Maternal grandmother was the first uh, in the family who had a VCR, and she had uh, the longest day on it. And so that's what started my love for the World War II Jeep. And after I became a doctor, I was able to uh, to purchase a World War II Jeep, which was uh, left to the French after the war. And so, um, in a way, I had a, a blank canvas with uh, with my Jeep. And um, I wanted to, well, obviously, as a doctor, mark it as uh, as part of a medical unit. And I had already, you know, been uh, interested in, in Patton and his third army. So uh, one thing led to another and I marked it as part of the 4th, 6th Armored Medical Battalion. And um, what I wanted to do was to just have a sort of a, uh, a superficial knowledge of the unit so that if I took my Jeep to any commemorative events in the Netherlands, I would be able to you know, tell the public just a little bit about the unit. But um, I came across a, a document on the internet, as you know, most amateur historians uh, get started, I think. And it was uh, titled Recollection of a Liberator, which was written by uh, Captain Lee, who was the uh, battalion S4, um, 44 to 6th Armored Medical Battalion. And in it, he described his uh, experiences during the liberation of Ortruf and Buchenwald. And that document just, you know, just never took hold of me, never let go. and. Um, well, that's what started my uh, my passion, I think. And would you uh, uh, say that it gives you an advantage when you're looking at documents because you're, you know, you are a doctor by trade, you have a sort of understanding of procedures, things like that. Because I can imagine if you don't have that knowledge, wading through period documentation, there's going to be some terminology that if you're not in the medical uh, world yourself, you might struggle with, and just general understanding of how procedures work. Did that give you an advantage? No, I, I think it definitely helps, um, especially because, you know, some of the, the developments during the war, such as the use of penicillin, I mean, it's, you know, you can really sort of value all the, all the developments that happened to, during the war, and, and you can sort of get a better understanding of all the, the difficulties that these men had to, uh, had to face and all the, the, the innovations they had to come up with in order to, to, to do their jobs. And so um, I think, you know, maybe... Um, um, it helps me just be just a little bit more in awe of them, uh, I think. Yeah, no, definitely. And, it, and it's there's very little we can take away from World War II as a positive. Uh, I mean, it was a tragic event that involved the deaths of millions, but medical advances were made during that war, as are always made during war in warfare. The same thing happened yep. in Vietnam and things like that, where these advances are taken. So we do have to th look at things, even when we talk about the celebrities and their plastic surgery, how much of that goes back to patching up and repairing pilots who were burned in Spitfires in 1940 and things like that. So we can always draw that can, uh, parallel between World War II and, and, and current technology with regards to medicine. So it kind of makes it tangible for people. Everybody watching this 
we all have experiences of hospital. We all have experiences of, of, of medical care in our lives. Most of us don't have experience of operating in armored divisions, so we, but we do understand medical care. So it's something we can all relate to. So without further ado, um, we will start um, the show. And as usual, uh, you've come armed with a wonderful PowerPoint presentation. We will go through it and I will hand over to you. And um, we're going to talk about the medics of the 4th Armored Division and the Battle of the Bulge. So, uh, folks, um, if you have questions for, for, for Renier or for me, then please fire away. But otherwise, I will hand over and um, we will all learn something. So over to you, my friend. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, as you mentioned, this is the topic for tonight, the medics of the 4th Armored Division in the Battle of the Bulge. And when we think about the 4th Armored in, uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, one particular photo comes to mind, um, which uh, uh, Don Fox and both uh, Kevin Himmel have already discussed the events uh, surrounding this photo, uh, showing the, the Cobra King reaching the besieged uh, American forces in Bastogne first, uh, which happened on December 26, 1944. And I thought what I would do for tonight is take that day, this, this um, well eventful day uh, and significant day in the history of the Fourth Harvard, and sort of take a snapshot of it and use that to to tell you the story about the medics of the uh, the fourth armored division uh, during the bulge because many other things happened that day and as we can see in the next uh, slide this is the morning report for company b of the 10th armored infantry battalion and it shows us that on december 26th these two enlisted men Private Oscar D. Klein and Staff Sergeant Leonard Garino. I'm sure I'm butchering their names at some point. Excuse me. No apologies for that. But they were severely wounded that day and they were evacuated to the 16th Field Hospital and the 39th uh, EVAC Hospital, respectively. And that um, report that we can see here really leaves out an awful lot of in, you know, intermediate steps that were taken by the medics to get them there. And, what I would like to do as part of my presentation is take you on what we might call a patient journey from the front lines to uh, to reach their uh, their destinations at the, uh, these these hospitals. But in order to to really understand what's going on, we need to take a quick look at the evacuation chain and the medical services within the division. So I'll start out with that. Then I'll quickly uh, discuss the, the days prior to the 26th, both uh, during the resting period that the, uh, the Fourth Armored uh, was granted, and the first days of, um, of the Battle of the Bulge. And then we'll, uh, we'll reach the, uh, the 26th of December. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about the, the patient journey, as I discussed. And after our casualties have reached their, their destinations, I will sort of broaden the view a bit and discuss some other medical events that happened that day and I'll uh, end up and I'll wrap up with uh, some uh, medical statistics for the fourth armature in the bulge. You, you sound like the perfect yeah. guest. You know, you, you got the you got outline, what you're going to talk about, and some nice statistics at the end. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, so there's an awful lot of information in this, uh, this graph that I created, um, showing you that um, my current line of work is probably better than seeking something in uh, graphic design. But, well, it, it does the job, I hope. Um, what we will see here, or what we can see here, is that the, the evacuation chain consists of five links called echelons. And depending on how severely wounded a casualty was, he would move further on down the line, uh, so further to, to more, uh, through more echelons. And so the most um, severely wounded would end up in the zone of the interior, or more commonly known as the United States of America. Uh, what we can also see is that the first two echelons were part of the division medical structure. So we will focus on those two first echelons uh, tonight. Um, and the uh, third, oh, excuse me, the, the third echelon uh, was uh, the responsibility of the field army. And so um, in this case, the, uh, the third army and the overlying sort of uh, um, uh, principle for the for the whole organization is that each echelon looks towards the front or the echelon in front of it and its uh, responsibility is to bring the wounded from the front line towards its own medical installations and so in case of the first echelon after providing casualties with first aid they would bring the wounded from the front line towards the battalion aid station the second echelon would do this with their uh, collecting units, bringing wounded from the battalion aid stations to their main uh, medical installations, which were the clearing stations. And what we can see is that the first echelon was the responsibility of the uh, uh, medical detachments of all the battalions. 
and the second echelon was the responsibility for the medical battalion in the in the in the division and the final point of notice is that the focus in the first two echelons was simply to preserve lives uh, nothing fancy keep the man alive uh, stabilize them uh, do whatever you can to make them transportable so they could uh, be evacuated further on down the line and so the focus on regaining health really started in the third echelon, so in the uh, in the army hospitals. Um, so next slide, please. Um, again, uh, a graphic with an awful lot of information. What I would like to highlight here is that the basic structure for a light armor division, as Don Fox already mentioned, are the separate battalions, and there are an awful lot of them. And so to, so to direct all these battalions, the uh, Army Division had four, shall we say, tactical headquarters, two of which were combat commands, uh, also showing us that the doctrine for uh, a light Army Division was to attack on two separate uh, parallel axes of advance, uh, with each of these uh, axes uh, sort of directed by one of the combat commands. It had a reserve command, which was simply there to direct all the um, uh, the, those combat units that were not engaged in, in combat at that time. It had a really small staff to do this. Um, and most of the armored divisions in the ETO upgraded this reserve command to a third combat command. So in a way they could start, shall we say, boxing with th uh, three fists rather than two. Um, the fourth armored division did not do that. Um, it, it stuck to the doctrine for most of the time with some notable exceptions, and the most well-known, obviously, is the fight towards uh, Bastogne, as you shall see. But this meant that they did have to upgrade it sort of temporarily to, to get it to, uh, uh, to a, a combat command uh, status, which also they had to do for the medical uh, services, as you shall see. And the final tactical um, uh, headquarters is Division Trains, which was there to move all the supply trucks and the supporting uh, units like the headquarters for the uh, medical battalion. Now, all the units to the left of this curvy uh, black line had their own medical detachment. So they had all, uh, these all had first echelon medical capabilities. The others didn't need it because they could uh, send their wounded straight to uh, the medical battalion uh, located at division trains. And so um, the second echelon was uh, the duty of the uh, armored medical battalion. In the case of the fourth armored, it was the 46th armored medical battalion with its crest uh, shown at the top right. The slogan, Ut Itum Servios, means to serve again, which is rather appropriate, I think. Mm -hmm. um, now, two points of notice. Um, it is the 46th and not the fourth armored medical battalion, as it is mentioned in many history books. Um, and, and still is uh, mentioned that, that way. It's a bit of a personal gripe, I have to admit. Um, and I think I figured it out. There's a, a document right after the war written by the US Army uh, about the order of battle in the ETO. And this typo was made there. And I think it just continued after that. Um, so once and for all, it's the 46 folks. Um, second point of note is the name changed every now and then from a medical battalion, comma, armored to armored medical battalion. For, for clarity reason, I'm just going to stick with this. Um, Perfect. So the, the organization, as we can see, it has a headquarters and headquarters company uh, attached to the division trains for our discussion tonight. Not all that interesting. Um, and it had three identical medical companies. Um, one of these uh, was um, attached to each of the combat commands. So it really made the combat command uh, rather, um, well, almost like a, a combined arms sort of self-supporting unit. Um, and each of these medical companies had a collecting platoon to bring the wounded from the battalion aid stations, as we have seen, and a clearing platoon to set up a clearing station. And as we can see, the third uh, medical company uh, was attached to division trains. It was referred to as the reserve medical company. And as we can see, it also had a collecting platoon and a clearing platoon. But there's something else there. There's what was called an auxiliary treatment center, which is a rather fanciful name for something that suggests that it was a that it was a larger company than the others, which it simply wasn't. It is a name that the Fourth Armored gave to a specific function that it wanted the reserve medical company to perform, which was the treatment of all the combat exhaustion cases. Right. This uh, auxiliary treatment center was set up and supervised by the division neuropsychiatrist, a major miracle, a fascinating character, maybe 
so for another discussion. Um, and the, the the reason why they they uh, wanted all their common exhaustion cases treated within the division was because the fourth armor did many things to keep all their well trained and experienced men uh, within the division. And so as soon as they were ready to return to duty, they could um, uh, return to duty from the division. Uh, another uh, measure that they took was they kept a log of all the relevant men who were evacuated to hospitals and they kept in touch with the hospitals so that whenever the men were ready, they would be able to return to the fourth armor and not end up in the replacement depot system. And if I could just jump in for a second, because I like to jump in for a second, it gives you a chance to have a sip of water. One of the things we've talked about um in this this series of shows has been the development of doctrine the the improvement of techniques you get some of these divisions like the fourth they've been through normandy they've learned hedgerows they've learned how to to, to engage the enemy they've developed these skills i'm sure the medical units are exactly the same they're, they're taking advice from them from their what they're experiencing themselves but also i'm guessing going back to june 44 in normandy generally American units in the ETO are learning what needs to be done and how they can improve systems. And particularly, I'm glad you mentioned the aspect of looking after people who are suffering from whatever you want to call it at the time, combat combat fatigue. We would talk about it today, PTSD. So are there definite um, improvements you can see from sort of June to December in, in 1944? Well, the most important uh, uh, aspect is that uh, what the 4th Armored Division found was that the link between the 2nd and the 3rd echelon was very weak. And at some times it stretched to the breaking uh, limit, uh, especially during the, the breakout of Normandy in August 44. The 4th Armored Division was racing across the Brittany Peninsula and reached Lorient, at which time the nearest evacuation hospitals were still located in Normandy, which would mean that all their wounded that were evacuated from the clearing stations had to be transported in Dutch ambulances strapped to litters for over 110 miles. And what they learned from that is that, um, that as you can imagine, is not, shall we say, necessarily advantageous to, uh, to your health. Um, and so they actually lost a couple of men who did not reach the evacuation hospitals alive simply because, you know, their wounds started bleeding again or their blood pressure dropped or whatever. And so, one of the things that they they did is something that we will see uh, later on in the presentation, um, which is the establishment of an uh, army ambulance regulating point. Uh, pretty much what what this what it does is um, what we, we should imagine that uh, ambulance drivers taking uh, men from the clearing platoons to the evacuation hospitals often did not have a clue which uh, hospital was still admitting patients. Uh, and even if they did, they might find that this hospital was packing up to relocate. And then they simply had to drive around looking for another hospital. Wow. And so this increased the chances of losing men. And so one of the developments was this army ambulance regulating point that they established, which pretty much just said, go there first. And there will be someone who knows which hospital are still admitting patients. And this is their exact location. So you could drive to them directly. Um, the second thing that, that they developed was they took field hospitals, which were units of 400 beds, and they split them up into field hospital platoons, each of about 100 beds. And so one of these platoons would be attached to one of the divisions. In the case of the 4th Armored Division, the first platoon of the 16th field hospital, and these smaller units would move with the division. And so whenever a division needed to evacuate severely wounded men, they also they, they always had one of these uh, field hospital units close by, which would be capable to, uh, to take on the most severely wounded cases. Now, what we can see here, because I can understand that, you know, for people who are not uh, um, sort of um, well educated into uh, this, uh, this whole system, uh, there's a lot to take in. And so what, I, what I've done is to, to take this, uh, this figure from the field uh, manual for armored medical units um, and to, to just give you another overview of what, what we're talking about. So what we can see here is sort of a, a bird's eye view of, uh, of an armored division in the field. And when we start adding a couple of lines, it will make it a lot uh, more clear. Um, what we can see here are two combat commands in the front separated by this, this black line in the middle. And we can see that uh, each of these combat commands has uh, three battalions attached to it. 
And in the back, there's the reserve command and the division trains. So now when we start adding the medical units to it, we can see that at the top, with each of these battalions at the front line, they each have uh, the battalion aid stations, symbolized by these crosses with the two vertical lines. And we see that each of the combat commands has a medical company, symbolized by this cross with the two axes and the letters CLR for clearing station. And we can see that the uh, reserve medical company is held in the back. Um, and when we add another layer, we can see, hopefully this can come through, yeah, that these blue lines symbolize the army ambulance units evacuating the wounded from the uh, separate uh, clearing stations to the, uh, to the uh, uh, hospitals in the back. Um, and and we, we, a good question we can ask now, I'll, I'll keep them in while we're going in, is, is, this, is this universal to every armor division? I asked you this before you went live, because obviously... The, each division had its own kind of command style. They have certain officers who are influential. So I'm assuming lots of things are standardized, but you did say that the 4th Armored Division has its own kind of unique aspects. So, so which of this is standard and which of this would be unique to the 4th? Well, when we, when we uh, go back to what I mentioned is that many of the Armored Division used their reserve command and, and upgraded it to a CCR, not to be um, confused with the, the band, um, so a combat command reserve. Uh, in order to function as a complete combat command, it needed a medical company attached to it. Uh, and so uh, I have not looked into it, but I can only imagine that they sort of uh, sacrificed the reserve medical company with all this extra function in order to have the uh, reserve command uh, upgraded to a combat command. And so the, the, the flexibility of the, the standard doctrine, which um, the reserve command gave an armored division, uh, was really important to the 4th Armored Division. And, and so that's the reason why they, they sort of stuck to this, uh, to this doctrine. Uh, Super. All right, so now that we have a basic understanding of the, the whole evacuation process, let's talk about the days before the Battle of the Bulge. Um, and what we can see here, what I call the calm before the storm, is uh, something about the resting period that the 4th Army Division was granted between December 8th and 18th, uh, 1944. And it needed it badly. Um, as Don Fox mentioned, the uh, month of November, the 4th Army Division fought in what was called the Lorraine Campaign, which was brutal on the 4th Armored Division. Um, the weather was terrible. Um, the mud made the, the armored uh, units uh, sort of road bound. Um, any casualties that were um, uh, had to be evacuated uh, across country had to be evacuated on the backs of sewer tanks because even the jeeps could not reach them with all this mud. Uh, it's also the time when the epidemic of trench food started in the ETO. And unfortunately, the 4th Armored Division was not immune to this. And so, all in all, what, what many of the 4th Armored veterans uh, refer to as the low point is really the, the Lorraine campaign. And so, what we can see here is a morning report for Company B of the 46th Medical Battalion. And it says at the bottom there uh, that as of December 9th, they have sort of settled in. They are their uh, normal operations of the clearing station, which are still, you know, uh, doing their... The weather is still rainy. The troops are receiving uh, their Christmas packages and the morale is good, so they're sort of settling in. Uh, the morale factor is really interesting because uh, all throughout the campaign, morale is reported as excellent, except for this day. So maybe receiving the Christmas packages just made the men a little bit more homesick, dropping their morale to just good, but who knows. Uh, but it, I mean, it's interesting because it ties a little bit with what we were talking about yesterday with Peter Lyon about the 28th Division, because they had been in the line in the hurt gun, and it was probably their lowest point of the war. Then they have a period of, of, as you say, their calm before the storm. And the 4th Armored Division have had a very different kind of campaign. And the fact that, as you say, trench foot, and then we could do an entire show at some point about trench foot in the ETO because it was a significant problem. I think a lot of people identify that as being a First World War thing, but it was it was rampant in, in, in World War II as well. So that's another subject as well. So here's another unit that has been at the, the point of the spear, so to speak, for months and, and badly needs a break, really, more than anything else. And then, as we know, bang, the Battle of the Bulge happened. So I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, what we can see here is another reason why the, the, so that the medics needed this break badly. It's a, a page taken from the Journal of the, the uh, Division Surgeon, so Lieutenant Colonel Morris Abrams' uh, office. And at the bottom there, we can see that during the Lorraine campaign, the medics lost 99 casualties. 
39 wounded, 15 KIA, 3 missing in action, and 42 non-battle casualties. The vast majority of these would be combat exhaustion cases. And it's interesting to note that they wrote that 23 of these were new replacements with the division. Wow. So what's going on there? Well, at the top of the page, we can read that during this resting period, the 4th Army is sending unsatisfactorily trained medics and replacement medics to uh, a five-day training course that they are setting up. Uh, and these men needed it badly. The replacement system in the ETO was dysfunctional at best, um, especially with the medics, I would say. And uh, uh, the 4th Armored Division during November actually received laboratory technicians um, and uh, jeep drivers and even army cooks to replace their, uh, their frontline medics. And so put yourself in, in the shoes of one of these, shall we say, the army cooks. Um, and, you know, you're arriving at the ETO, you're transported uh, to uh, one of these rebel devils, the replacement depots. Um, and all of a sudden, someone from the 4th Army is coming uh, to collect you and hand you a medic bags and, you know, says good luck. And then you find yourself in the front line. Um, it's, I mean, just to, to enter combat for the first time is, is bad enough. And then to enter it in, and has to, you know, having to perform a job that you have absolutely no training for. And then have all these experienced veterans looking at you to save their lives whenever they get, uh, they get wounded. I mean, is it any wonder that many of them simply, you know, succumb to the pressure? I mean, it's, 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 I think it's really logical. And so this, this training schedule that we can see in the, in the middle part of the page is really basic stuff. I mean, it starts with what does a, you know, a medical unit in the 4th Armored Division actually do? Um, it shows how to apply a bandage, uh, how to use a morphine syrette. And, uh, you know, what do you write on an emergency medical tag? What are the, you know, what are the terms that we actually use? And uh, interestingly enough, how to, you, to load an ambulance. And as we can see, it says there a PEEP ambulance, which reminds us that within the 3rd Army, the vehicle that we commonly know as a, a Jeep was referred to as a PEEP in the 3rd Army. So whenever you see that, that's 3rd that's Army uh, there. Mm. It just I want to jump in. It's, it, we, we said at the beginning of the show about how everyone has a, an understanding of medical procedures. And there's an echo here with our medical services dealing with COVID. I mean, we don't want to go down and talk about COVID and, and you know people watching this channel to get a break from, from the current goings on. But it is interesting. We think about the medical procedures that are necessary, but we don't think about the strain upon the professionals having to be engaged at the front line, so to speak, for weeks and weeks and weeks with, with inadequate training about something that is new. It, there's a real parallel with what we're going through right now. But um, yeah, to think that the medics themselves are, are, are struggling in this situation is, is really telling. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So if, yeah, um, so this is where the, the Battle of the Bulge really begins. Um, these uh, next, two, next uh, few slides are uh, documents taken from the Battalion S3 journal. And so we can see that in the morning of December 18th, the training program is still continuing. Um, so everything, you know, the, the, is simply going on as planned. And then about seven o'clock uh, in the evening, the division is placed on one hour alert. And we can see that Company B of the 46th is moving out at around midnight. It was attached to uh, CCB of the division. And this is significant, as uh, Don Fox has mentioned and uh, uh, Kevin Himmel has already mentioned. This means that when Patton goes to Verdun on the 19th for the conference, his divisions have already had have a 12-hour head start, uh, which is what we can see here. And during the 19th and the 20th, we simply see that all the other uh, units are moving north uh, to their respective starting positions for the upcoming uh, uh, counteroffensive. So then we can go to the next slide. And this is the, uh, the same document for December 22nd to the 25th. There are three points I would like to highlight. The, uh, for the 22nd, uh, we can see that an ambulance relay is established at Messancy. I'll talk about this, uh, this function a bit later on. And what's really interesting that orders are received that all personnel will carry their gas masks when outside of their billets. Now, at first glance, you might think that this is simply because the US Army was afraid that the German Army would start using chemical weapons. But when we read Peter Kadagadov's fantastic book, Snow and Steel, he actually points us in the right direction. 
Um, it's a countermeasure for Ortoskosenius Orthos, Krijf commandos, as we uh, could call them. Uh, the U.S. Army found out that these Germans who were wearing uh, American uniforms did not carry gas masks. And so by ordering your own men to start carrying gas masks, it makes identifying them just that one easier. Um, uh, so I thought that was an and, interesting Unless, idea. of course, you phone them away, because as we know, a lot of people, uh, if, if, even at the beginning, I watched Battleground, you know, the, the, the amazing film about the 101st, about the first thing they do in that film is they throw their gas masks away when they arrive in Baston. So all very well if you kept yours. If you haven't, maybe you'll be mistaken for a German. But but fantastic detail. And this is why I love bringing people like that yourself onto the show for giving this extra level of examination. Really brilliant stuff. Well, you know, that's an advantage of moving with an armored division because there's always uh, enough storage space to keep your yeah. gas mask. Uh, you don't have to carry it around. So that's uh, that's OK. Um, so the, the report for December 23rd and 24th is really interesting because this is where it shows that the reserve command is actually being upgraded to a third combat command. We see that Lieutenant Pollock and four ambulances from C Company, which was the reserve company, are sent to support the reserve command. Now, what we can also see is that the Reserve Command is not getting its own medical company like the other combat commands. It will have to evacuate its wounded through the adjacent uh, combat commands, which, because it was located on the right side of the division, uh, would be Combat Command A. And so they had to evacuate to the clearing station of Company A of the 46th. Um, so really what, is, what this is telling us is that in order to uh, evacuate the wounded from this temporary uh, reserve combat command, um, they need a, a temporary collecting platoon uh, because they are using the clearing station of another company. And so Lieutenant Pollock with his four ambulances uh, is simply a, a temporary or an extra uh, collecting platoon. And due to the heavy casualties that they had to uh, evacuate, we can see that uh, on the 24th, uh, they are given five additional army ambulances just to to uh, upgrade uh, their their uh, transportation capacity. Super. And on the twenty fifth, uh, one, one moment now, that's all right. We can see that this reserve command is shifted from the uh, right flank of the division all the way to the left flank, and so they have to start evacuating to the uh, through the uh, clearing platoon of the other medical company up front, which is Company B. Uh, and this puts a reserve command in a uh, in this, the proper position to advance, uh, which would lead them to uh, break the, the siege of Bastogne on the 26th. Um, now, before we start looking at the, the, the events of the 26th, uh, I do want to show you this because you know it always gets to me this this message. Um, it's one of the messages sent from the G4. Uh, it might have been from the division sergeant actually to the uh, commanding officer of the 46th Medical Battalion. It was sent on Christmas Eve, 1944, and it says, instruct your Graves Registration Unit attached with Company A to pick up five dead of the 53rd Armored Infantry Battalion in the cemetery on the left into Bigonville, and then there are 10 more in town. Um, so these are 15 American uh, KIA um, that they had to pick up on Christmas Eve, 1944, which just shows you the brutality of, of the combat that the 4th Armored had to uh, endure during the Battle of the Bulge uh, there. Mm. So now we have finally reached the 26th of December. And just as a reminder, these are the two uh, 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 casualties that we're going to look at. Private Oscar Klein, who's going to move to the 16th Field Hospital, and St Sergeant Guarino, who's going to be evacuated to the 39th EVAC. So now what we can look at is uh, this map. Um, this map shows the area of operations for Combat Command B, of which the 10th Armored Infantry Battalion was a part of on the December 26th. And we can see that they are uh, advancing or attacking north, which was symbolized by the black arrow at the top there. And they were attacking towards the village of Grand Rue and then uh, later on towards uh, Clochimont. And uh, to be honest, I have absolutely no idea where our two uh, soldiers were uh, wounded. But let's say, for argument's sake, that they were uh, wounded at the uh, at Grand Rue. And statistically speaking, they would probably be wounded by artillery or, or mortar shrapnel. Yeah. Um, and so let's say, for argument's sake, that this, this is what happens. And so that triggers the, the whole evacuation chain, as we have discussed earlier. And so we can now start our patient journey. And our patient journey should start with this, which is the first aid package of, that every American soldier carried. 
It contained a bandage and the almost infamous uh, sulfur powder shaker that we can see in the top left there. Um, their instructions were um, to, uh, when you are wounded, open up your first aid package, apply your own bandage after uh, shaking this, uh, this envelope of uh, sulfur powder on the, on the wound. And then after that, open the wound tablets package that you can see in the bottom there. There are eight tablets there and you have to take them one at a time with a patient uh, uh, patiently waiting for the next uh, you know, for the interval to uh, to end, and then you take another one, and you have to take it with lots of water because if you don't, you will end up with a severe case of diarrhea, unless you are wounded in the abdomen, in which case you are not supposed to take these tablets at all. But let's take a moment. Let's say you are wounded by shrapnel, you know, and severely wounded at that, as we have as we have seen. You are having what Nicholas Moran or uh, the chieftain on YouTube will probably describe as uh, a significant emotional event um, and you know you have been trained in first aid if you're lucky about two hours during your basic training um, and so realistically what you're going to do you're going to shout for a medic I mean that's that's really what, what you're what we're going to do um, for any reenactors out there um, the use of this uh, sulfur powder was discontinued early in 1945 because it was found that it acted as a foreign body so much like a splinter rather than helping uh, wounds to heal. Um, the thought process of these wound tablets was that anything that would penetrate a, a body would first have to penetrate a dirty uh, uniform and then unwashed skin. And so the chances of any wound being infected was um, excellent, shall we say. And so anything that you could do early on to start some antibiotical treatment would, uh, would help to, um, to heal these wounds. Uh, but like I said, the, the sulfur powder only hindered it, uh, it, as it turned out. So the, the wound tablet is some kind of um, antibiotic. Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, it's, it's a sulfur drug. Yeah. Yeah. And generally, just, you know, as a medical professional, what's your gut feeling about giving everybody their own little mini first aid kit? Because it's one of those things, you know, you, it's better. I did first aid courses when I was, you know, a tour guide working, you know, someone who knows what they're doing is an advantage. Someone who doesn't know what they're doing can actually be a hindrance. So what's your feeling about this policy of, of having your own gear? Uh, well, I think there, there are a couple of um, uh, uh, factors that we have to consider. First of all, I think it's a morale issue that you are carrying something that you can treat yourself with. Yeah. Um, so that might be uh, might be helpful. And also for the medics, um, they usually took the, 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 the casualties first aid kit simply to preserve their own uh, supply of bandages. So whenever they could, they would just take uh, you know, the stuff that the soldier was carrying himself. And so to have some extra medical supplies at the front is really, well, it can actually be helpful. That's a good point. And I particularly like what you said about the morale there, because the army is constantly giving you things to inflict wounds and death on the enemy. But the fact they're giving you a medical kit gives you this idea they do care about you as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Brilliant stuff. When we talk about, oh, sorry, when we talk about medics, when we talk about the modern army, we often use the teeth to tail ratio to describe the uh, sort of the front line soldiers with the uh, the whole um, supply chain and, and all the supporting units i think maybe we should add an extra organ in there and uh, i vote to uh, insert a heart and, and call the medical services the heart of the beast uh, really mm. good point um and so when you when these casualties did holler out for uh, or holler for uh, for a medic this is what they would have seen this is a photo taken from a fourth armored company eight man probably from a, a tank battalion actually uh, the photo was taken in september um, and what we can see is really what these this company eight men were capable of doing, which really isn't that much more than first aid. I mean, they were carrying some bandages. They had a tourniquet, which was of extremely poor design. They, they quickly found out that using a, a soldier's belt was actually more effective as a tourniquet. Um, after the fall of 1944, they actually started carrying morphine syrettes. So before that, they did not carry them. They had to be upgraded to that. Um, and these guys were, became experts in, in innovation and, and improvisation. I mean, when you are faced with someone who has a, a chest wound that is letting in air from the outside into the chest cavities, which uh, sort of implodes or, or uh, prevents the lung from functioning, um, they quickly found out that if you cut up a piece from your um, raincoat and you uh, take that over the wound, 
it prevented more air from being sucked into the chest cavity. Mm. And when you ran out of a raincoat, some of them actually took a large stone and placed that over the over the wound just to prevent more air from from being sucked in. And so it really was a a, a, a case of you know making do with what was around you to to help these men survive. And like I said, it was simply first aid, get the men uh, out of there, uh, keep them alive, uh, stop bleeding, and then get them moving. So that, that that's the name of the game for the, the company eight men. Um, and so the next uh, in line is bringing the wounded from the front line towards the medical uh, station. And so this were done by these jeeps, which is, uh, this photo is taken during the Battle of the Bulge of a, a litter baron jeep of the 53rd uh, Army Infantry Battalion. And we can see the two casualties uh, strapped to the litters on, on the back. In the map on the right, this is symbolized by the red arrow going uh, from Grand Rue towards Menufontaine, where the uh, 10th Armored Infantry Battalion's Battalion Aid Station was located at uh, on the 26th. I've got a great so our... question for you, just to jump in there, from um, David Levine there, saying, um, did the types of wounds differ in tank companies as opposed to infantry companies? I mean, my gut instinct is going to be yes, but the point is, was there documentation? So, because so you, you said earlier about the, 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 the types of wounds are probably going to be mortars and shellings, but was the ratio or types of, of injuries different from an armored division to an infantry division? Well, um, um, I'm sure there were some differences, but uh, at the end of the day, if you're hit by an 88, um, and struck by shrapnel in the tank or, you know, hit by shrapnel from an artillery round, the, the types of wounds are pretty much going to be the same. You might un, uh, think that the tank battalion suffered more burn wounds uh, than the armored infantry battalions. Uh, generally speaking, the armored infantry battalions were far worse off. Um, they had far more casualties. They did have the, the, uh, the largest medical detachment uh, and they needed it. So, um, but I don't have any specific t statistics to, to support any uh, any differences on that. Okay, thank you. So now our wounded is, uh, has arrived at Menu Fontaine and um, they're uh, uh, entering a battalion aid station, which is shown here. This photo is actually taken from, I think it was a, a, a live magazine that followed a patient, George Lott, um, and it is uh, taken at a battalion aid station of the uh, 35th Infantry uh, Division. But it does show us what uh, the insides or the, the, the scenes at a battalion aid station would look like. Because um, the, the term battalion aid station sort of suggests a well-defined and well-organized medical installation. And realistically, it was simply wherever a battalion surgeon was with some medical supplies and some medical equipment. So it could literally be in a ditch uh, under a tree or in the, uh, the cellar of a bombed house or whatever. And so what we see here in this photo is probably taken in a cellar or in a barn uh, because there's straw on the floor. Um, and it shows what, uh, what the medical capabilities at a battalion aid station were. I mean, we can see that both arms are splinted, which is one of the things that, uh, that they would do in, uh, in the battalion aid station. And we can see that the battalion surgeon who's kneeling uh, on the front left of the, of the photo is inserting a needle for blood plasma, which is one of the major innovations uh, during the yeah. war to uh, maintain um, at least blood volume and blood pressure. Uh, it did absolutely nothing for the uh, uh, transportation capabilities of oxygen of the blood. It does need red blood cells for that. And so uh, during the war, uh, the innovation shifted towards whole blood transfusion, but again, that might be a topic for another uh, for another evening, uh, Paul. Um, yeah, well, just to interrupt, we're getting some great questions coming in. So I'll fire away with the first. This has come up a couple of times in the sidebar. One is whether there's any kind of extra stigma within Patton's Third Army for um, battle fatigue, combat fatigue, PTSD, countries. given Patton's own um, opinions about you know the soldier in Sicily. Was there anything different in Third Army about 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 a sort of stigma with regards to that kind of casualty? Um, not that I have found. Uh, I think that overall the U.S. Army was struggling to uh, how to to deal with combat exhaustion, and the the, the problem was that in during the um, we're going a bit down a rabbit hole a bit, uh, Paul. But that's yeah, fine. Um, uh, the, the problem was that the army uh, when they started fighting in North Africa was absolutely uh, not equipped to deal with combat exhaustion whatsoever, uh, simply because they thought that by making a more vigorous selection of uh, humans who were uh, admitted into the army, 
they would not have any combat exhaustion because the men were just simply better than they had been during World War uh, World War One. Uh, and so when they found that there was this huge drain of personnel due to combat uh, exhaustion, um, and who were all evacuated down the line through you know third and fourth echelon uh, hospitals, and they actually could not return them to duty. Uh, somehow these men were not able to to function and, and go back. And so in order to, to counter this huge drain, the army came up with a couple of things. One was the term combat exhaustion, because it's so much easier to explain to a soldier what your treatment is going to be if you're simply exhausted. I mean, you're just going to have to sleep for a couple of nights. And so that's exactly what they did. And the second thing is that they started setting up the, the treatment close to the front. And so they really wanted to keep the, most of the combat exhaustion cases close to the front. They would sedate them for 48 hours and then they would uh, interview them for maybe a, a minute or two. Um, and then if they were able to uh, withstand the sound of artillery in the distance, they would be returned uh, back to the front, which is, like I said, it's an army policy and not a, a third army uh, policy. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, the fourth army did absolutely everything just to, to keep their well-trained and experienced men uh, within the division because they had the experience that replacements just you know we're not uh, up to par really yeah and just a couple more questions and we just to try and do them quickly one is what would be done in the case of burns because obviously the medical kit you showed earlier is not useless against burns but it's not the right gear to use against burns um, and then also about um, vehicles what vehicles would, would be used someone asked about you know weasels and things like that were there any improvements in vehicles so let's Burns and then vehicles, if you wouldn't. Burns and vehicles, sure. Um, with regards to burns, um, the, the, within the, the first two echelons, simply uh, uh, resuscitate men to have them uh, capable of withstanding evacuation to, to the third echelon. So it's, it's the basic stuff, uh, you know, uh, keep their blood pressure up by uh, administering uh, large amounts of uh, blood plasma. Um, you know, that maybe um, uh, this start the antibiotical treatment because uh, burn wounds uh, uh, tend to get infected quite uh, quite quickly. Um, so really not that much different from all the other uh, wounds that they encounter. Um, but the, the different treatments really would happen at the, at the third echelon uh, medical installations. And with regards to the weasels, yes, during the Lorraine campaign, the Fourth Armored actually received two weasels to experiment with. And they, as I said, they, they used tour tanks to evacuate some of their wounded. Um, and they found that the weasels were uh, an improvement over the Jeep. And so they did receive uh, more weasels in, uh, early on in 1945. Um, and they, they really helped to evacuate the wounded. But as often in, in the history of World War II in the, in the ETO, uh, it was a little bit too late to be really effective because during early, early 45, the, the weather improved and so they really didn't need it that much. Um, cool. Fun fact, the, the, the division um, received uh, skis to use uh, to, to transport wounded on, uh, so you could use a, place a litter on them and they actually received them at the end of uh, January, early February. So. Winter was already over, and they were um, yeah. receiving skis to uh, to evacuate them. So um, right, that's typical yeah. army. You you get the stuff you need just after you finish needing it. Yeah, that's absolutely. Uh, that's the right way, the wrong way in the army way, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now we have uh, finished the first echelon with the battalion aid station, and now we are moving into the second echelon, um, the collecting platoon. And we can see on the left here a photo of uh, one of the the jeep. Uh, sorry, the ambulances from the collecting platoon of uh, Company B. This photo was actually taken in May 45 in uh, the Czech Republic, in the town of Susice, but it's one of their, it's one of their, uh, their ambulances. And the, the route is, um, or the, the, uh, the direction they, they took on the, the December 26th is um, uh, the uh, orange uh, arrow in the, the map on the right which uh, to, in today it would be a drive of about 15, maybe 20 minutes. A, a beautiful drive because it takes you through the Forêt d'Anlier, which is absolutely magnificent. Yeah. Uh, and our uh, casualties would end up at the clearing station, which was located at Anlier uh, itself. Now, this photo that we show here on the left is a clearing station. Uh, this photo was taken in Normandy. And we can see the ambulance has, has just arrived. Uh, the medics are uh, preparing to take the wounded out 
and then you would enter them into the clearing station, um, which is the tent on the right. Um, now, obviously, as the weather deteriorated, they moved the clearing station indoors uh, whenever possible. But the basic idea is still this, um, uh, this clearing station, this tent here. And if we go to the next slide, we can see what's actually beneath this tent. Uh, each uh, clearing platoon would have two of these surgical trucks, which is a, an, uh, a deuce and a half with a, a fixed cabin on the back that would carry all the medical supplies and equipment. And whenever the, the company would hold, um, the, uh, the medics would uh, uh, set up this tent or set up in, in the building. Um, they would uh, take out all the equipment and we can see what would be going on under this tent. In the photo on the bottom, we can see the cabin of the, the deuce and a half uh, on the right there. We can somehow make up the wheel arches there behind the, the man sitting there. Yep. We can see the uh, the wounded uh, on his uh, litter on what you call, I think you call it saw horses, don't you? Um, like stands. Um, um, and we can yeah. See yeah, we can see two doctors uh, who are operating on uh, on uh, a patient there, which is really simply uh, emergency procedures. I think that the, the best equivalent, modern day equivalent of a, a clearing station would be a trauma room in an emergency room. Right. That, that pretty much gives you an idea what would be going on. So, and were the vehicles of the, of the deuce and a half type, was that unique to the armor divisions or would infantry divisions have them as well? Because obviously an armor division theoretically is moving faster and you'd need to have a, a faster moving medical unit or are they co commonly used by everybody? Um, and actually, I don't know the, the, the answer to that. Um, um, well, I haven't seen them in infantry divisions in Normandy. I, I'm guessing it's an armor division thing myself. but I, I think so, yeah. Well. But, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 honestly, I don't know. Um, the... Um, the basic principle for an armored division is to be uh, mo highly mobile, and yeah. so, and, and also an infantry division would have a, a clearing company uh, yeah. rather than a clearing platoon. So an infantry division would have one clearing station for the entire division, whereas the armored division had three uh, smaller ones to uh, to move with uh, with the combat commands. Um, in uh, October 1944, the the clearing stations were upgraded somewhat. They received uh, small refrigerators that enabled them to uh, start using whole blood uh, transfusion rather than simply um, uh, simply the blood plasma. And as I already mentioned, this really helped in resuscitating the patient. So it was a huge upgrade. Now, in order for us to to get sort of a glimpse in the scenes, what would be happening at a at a, a clearing station, I have taken three quotes from the book on the right. It was written by Charles E. Wilson, who was uh, an infantry a rifle replacement during the Battle of the Bulge, who actually ended up in the 10th Armored Infantry Battalion. Um, and after the Bulge, he requested a transfer, which was actually granted, and he became um, the uh, assistant to one of the chaplains, Father O'Donnell, who was attached to Combat Command B. And so both Wilson and Father O'Donnell would often be found in the clearing station of Company B. And so this, um, uh, these quotes you know, gives something of a glimpse of what will be happening at the at the clearing station of, of Company B. And I will read them for you, um, or at least I'll try. Uh, Almost everywhere in the room, I can hear the low groans of unsedated victims of war. The room becomes a tubed jungle of plasma lines descending from hooked heights into arms of pale-faced men. So obviously they are in shock. Blood is the word in simple description. Blood-soaked, cutaway uniforms lay piled around stretchers and blood drips on the dirty floors and trickles into the makeshift aisles. So that, you know, in a couple of sentences, rather poetically uh, describes what, what's going on. Um, the second one reads, some soldiers are brought in on their feet, psychologically disoriented. They jabber as though they were hit by something that knocked loose their store of words in a jumble of meaningless sounds. Words poured out incoherently with snatches of speech carrying verbal images of past, and present in wild disorder. Now, obviously, this is a common exhaustion uh, patient who is yeah. uh, who is describing. And the third quote is um, are actually uh, some um, uh, sn uh, snippets that I've taken from an entire page just to to shorten it a bit. Two eight men escort a soldier into the room. His uniform is in tatters. Much of his hair burned off his head. Encased in his very dirty face are two circles of blood where once his eyes had been. A doctor brings two balls of cotton, puts them in my hand, saying, hold these gently in his eyes. 
I cautiously placed the cotton balls in his eye sockets, and as I do, a stretcher is brought in and placed on the floor in front of us. It holds the remains of a dead American soldier. My patient, aware of the discussion as to where the stretcher should be laid, cries out in a pitiful voice, please, sir, take care of my body first. And this undoes uh, Private Wilson, and so he, he continues, a doctor noticing my unnerving mutterings gently releases me from my self-denying patient, and I squeeze past the crowding press of human suffering to catch a gulp of fresh outdoor air. Again, um, wow. just to give us a, something of a glimpse of the, the, the scenes that will be going on at clearing. Yeah, at clearing and yeah, I mean, and, and they are incredibly moving, those, those comments, and so thank you for showing them. But the other way of looking at it is, is if the enemy, if the Germans could see this kind of procedure, they would be completely jealous because the idea of blood plasma, penicillin, morphine, this evacuation process, this is something the German army didn't have early in the war. And it's, you know, it's it's struggling now, as Peter Caddy Adams talked about, 50,000 horses in the German advance. They would be they would be amazed at the technological advances the Americans have. Yes, it's a place of suffering, but it's also a place where a huge number of men are being are having their lives saved, which wouldn't be possible on the enemy side. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it is interesting that the, the, the Fourth Armored Division did um, happily accept any captured uh, uh, German medical supplies, and they used it in two ways. Uh, first of all, the, uh, they would send it to for any German POWs to be able to treat their own wounded. Um, but some of the medical, uh, uh, especially the equipment, so the, the, uh, the, the surgical equipment, was sometimes better from the Germans. And so they used that uh, whenever they could. Um, so, so that's really interesting. And what, we had a question earlier. What, what was the policy with regards to German POWs? Is it, is it strictly triage or are they treated after Americans? Um, no, they're, they're strictly triage. They would they would treat them, um, um, you know, pretty much the same. Yeah. Cool. So uh, uh, th those who needed uh, to be treated first to to stay alive, they, they would be treated first. Perfect. Thank you. So the, uh, now that we have reached the the end of the second echelon, our our uh, casualties still have to be transported to the evacuation or field hospitals. And this is something that I'm very excited about because what I'm about to show you is a discussion that we can follow that took place 77 years ago uh, in a couple of messages. So we can see here that early in the morning of December 26th, the adjutant, Lieutenant Hamlin, at, at uh, uh, 1 a.m. in the morning, is sending this message to the division surgeon. He's actually using a slide X, which is uh, uh, something that I've really not uh, completely understand. It, it's a type of, of coding machine. I think it's a British coding machine that they were using, but anyway. Um, the message reads, all evacuation hospitals are filled. It is impossible for the relay to dispose of patients. Please advise. Now, it's interesting to note he has scratched out or, or stricken out the word handle, so he can still handle them. He simply cannot dispose of them. Um, and this is a, a good moment for us to discuss this relay station that we have already seen in, uh, that was set up in Messancy. The idea of a relay station is that any ambulances moving towards the evacuation hospitals would pass through this relay station, and it is simply there to keep the flow of ambulances towards the, the clearing stations uh, going. Um, the, the clearing stations were not large units, and so in order for them to not to be swamped with patients, they needed to be transported out there quickly. And so whenever a, an ambulance reached this e relay point, uh, another ambulance would move towards the clearing station, or if there was no other ambulance available at the relay station, they could leave their patients at this relay station. It was also uh, located with uh, uh, with another medical unit, um, and so this ambulance could race back towards the clearing station just to keep the, the, the flow of um, casualties from the front line going. Uh, it's almost like a beach master on the invasion beach. Absolutely. It's keeping that flow. It's keeping everything moving because once everything snarls up, problems begin. If everything's fluid and everyone's moving, there, there's a, there, everything is working more efficiently. Absolutely. And what we see here is that, again, the link between the second and the third echelon is by far the weakest. Uh, because imagine that you know you, you are uh, responsible of, of, uh, for uh, evacuating um, uh, all these wounded, and you know there's there's no place for them. Um, so what are you going to do? Well, luckily the division surgeon is looking into it, and we see the next message, which is an answer to this. 
try to evacuate to the 32nd or the 106th, and if there are no help, evacuate to the 34th at Metz. Um, this was sent at uh, 0400 um, in the same morning. So the 32nd evac was actually located at Thionville, which is about 45 miles back. The 106th, I think, was located at Sedan, which is about 55, uh, 55, 50 miles back, sorry for that. And the 34th at Metz is 55 miles further uh, down the line. And so, like we uh, like we've seen in Normandy, they ran the risk of having to take their uh, their wounded for all these you know, dozens of miles, uh, being severely wounded. You know, the the, the risk of uh, wounds starting to bleed again, um, uh, blood pressure dropping. And so this is, shall we say, far from ideal. And so they're uh, actually scrambling to to solve this problem. Um, and so at the end of the day, we see this message um, and that finally, in, uh, at the end of the day, they, uh, they have organized an army ambulance relay point, uh, sorry, regulating point, which will open at uh, 2000 hours uh, at Allon. So all army ambulances are going through that re uh, regulating point first, then they will go to the relay point and then they can move on. So uh, um, this, this regulating point, um, is uh, uh, simply there to direct them. This is the evac hospital that is still uh, accepting patients. This is its uh, its location. This is where this patient is going. Um, yeah. And so now we um, our patients are still uh, located at at Company B at Anlier, as we can see in the map on the right. Uh, we have the the entire technical situation of the medical uh, evacuation chain uh, on December 26 there. We can see the three combat commands uh, uh, up north. We can see which combat command is evacuated to which medical company. And this is where we left our, um, our casualties. The photo on the left, we can see uh, uh, one of the locations of the, the clearing station of company B. And we can just make out that the ambulance standing there, uh, the, the markings on the bumper start with 3A. So it's, uh, it's a third army uh, ambulance unit that's, uh, that's uh, starting the third echelon. And so what we can see is from company B in Anlier, um, if it's uh, late enough in the day, so after eight o'clock, they will first move to Arlon, to this uh, army ambulance regulating point. And before that, they will drive through Arlon straight down to the ARP, which is the uh, ambulance relay point located at Messancy. Now, as we have discussed, this is uh, the, the relay point is simply there to keep the flow of ambulances towards the, uh, the clearing stations going. And this is also the location of the first platoon of the 16th Field Hospital. Um, the um, first platoon uh, was attached to Fourth Armored, and so this was close by. Uh, so all the major uh, and, and more severe uh, wounded casualties would go there. So all the, the, the head trauma, uh, the chest trauma, would go to the uh, the 16th Field Hospital. Um, and uh, a day after this, on the 27th, the um, the uh, first uh, platoon 16th field hospital actually went on double shifts they uh, they uh, kept their personnel going 24 hours a day just to to uh, keep going and to to treat all the wounded that they had to and so One of the things the takeaways i want to just add in here is that we connecting it to the other shows we've done is just like the ninth air force we talked about with john bernstein just like the 28th division is that that there's a lot of extra pressure on this system. This this system, the Fourth Armor Division, have developed since normally is 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 re is reasonably efficient. They've got a system worked out. But the the suddenness of the Ardennes offensive by the Germans, the enormity of it, is putting strain on everything. It's 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 working, but the distances are now having to be increased because they're getting more casualties. And it's it's that it's referencing again the unpreparedness generally the Allies were for a massive offensive at this time of year. It's just everybody really wasn't expecting it. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, in order to, to have the system uh, functioning, they uh, remember uh, the, the Third Army was, uh, was focusing on Operation Tink, so yeah. moving east. And so everything, the, the whole supply system, the whole evacuation system was prepared for a movement east. And now all of a sudden, a large part of the army has to go north, including all the, the supply and all the evacuation uh, units. And when we look at, uh, you know, one of the evacuation units that was go that the U.S. Army had was a 400 bed unit, which was semi-mobile. So it yeah. had the, the transport capabilities using 20 uh, deuce and a half trucks to uh, transport half of its equipment in one hole. The other unit was a 750 bed evac hospital, which had a grand total of, wait for it, 
two GMCs, two transports, all of his equipment. So it was static. And so moving them uh, or racing them up north just to, to, to treat the wounded was a major, uh, uh, you know, a major hurdle they had to take. And, and the other difference between Operation Tink that never happened, we talked about it on the show with Kevin Hemel, and, and the, what they're dealing with here is, is had Tink happened, everybody would have known what the Allied plan is. You're, follow, you ex, you're knowing where you're expecting the advance to go. You're, you're, yeah. you're controlling the events as the Allies as opposed to what the Ardennes is, which is reacting to what the Germans are doing. So that's putting everything is, the pressure is on because you don't know what their next moves are. Whereas the operation advancing, you're kind of in, yeah, you're influencing the outcome and you should be directing the traffic yourself because you know what the plan is. So that we, yeah, they're very different operations in that regard. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And so um, uh, one of our uh, uh, our patients are leaving the, the clearing station, and we can actually know uh, who was bringing them to uh, to their uh, uh, final destinations uh, in the in the hospitals. It was a platoon of the 456th Ambulance Company that was attached on from the 23rd of December onwards to uh, to Company B. These men were attached for rations only, so they would stay with the company Company B just to have ambulances ready there to, to start transporting uh, the wounded from the clearing stations. And so in order to feed these men, they were attached for, for rations only, as we, can, as we can see. And so now they're moving down uh, again through the uh, uh, ARP, or if it's late enough, uh, the uh, regulating point first. Um, and uh, our first casualty, Private uh, Oscar Klein, has reached his destination, which was located in this building, the Villa Clange at maison -C. Uh, and so he's reached this, uh, the first platoon of the 16th Field Hospital, uh, entering the, um, the medical installation of the third echelon. And our second casualty, uh, Staff Sergeant Gorino, is uh, moving towards the, the, the west, towards Virton, uh, which is shown in the next slide, um, which was located at the Collège Saint-Joseph in, uh, in Virton. Uh, and so this is where he, uh, he reached the, uh, the evacuation hospital. And what was the time scale of these two evacuations? And were those time scales typical or, or, or slow or fast based on others at the time? Um, well, it, it varied an awful lot. Uh, it's very difficult to say. If you, if you drive from uh, Grand Rue all the way to, uh, to Virton, um, you know, you, in today you might, you know, take, oh, I don't know, uh, half an hour, 45 minutes uh, maybe. But again, it's it's all depending on how quickly everybody is is evacuating. So if there's an ambulance waiting uh, at the clearing station, it goes a lot faster. If they have to wait for an ambulance to arrive, you know, add an hour, uh, add an half hour. So it's 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 um, it's very fluid. I, I couldn't tell you a typical um, a typical day. And again, this is also the day that some of them had to be evacuated to Metz and Sedan and and uh, Thionville. And so, in a way, our two casualties were very lucky that they were uh, ended up in in hospitals that, that were relatively close to the front. Um, well, that's the thing, isn't know. it? The, the, the bizarre thing about the Ardennes offensive is, is, as we know from Patton's meeting on the nineteenth, is he was in Luxembourg City, that an area of relative quiet and and areas that have been liberated weeks earlier isn't that very far away from the absolute major maelstrom of the battle it's really only uh, you know 20 30 miles in places so it's it's a it's an odd battle in that regard is that you can be an area an area of relative safety and and not very far away from an area of absolute you know major combat it's just the nature of the battle of the bulge i guess yeah oh, absolutely no so um from some of the uh, um some of the viewers may have noticed that company c so the reserve medical company uh, is located even further south it's located at Réon um which is uh, on the French side of the border. And it was located in this school building uh, that we can see here. Um, and some of you might wonder, well, why are they keeping this reserve medical company this far back from the front line? And it had uh, a couple of reasons. The main reason was because of this long uh, evacuation uh, hall back to Metz. Um, when uh, wounded, severely wounded men uh, left the uh, army relay or the ambulance relay point, and they uh, had to be uh, transported another, you know, 50 miles back, they could uh, sort of take a small medical pit stop, if you like, at the uh, reserve medical company, where uh, doctors would uh, examine them, uh, administer more blood pressure uh, plasma if they needed it, you know, uh, uh, slap on a new bandage or whatever, and so sort of bring them resuscitate them or stabilize them even more 
to give them a better chance to uh, to survive the uh, the 50 miles back to uh, to Nancy. So this is the main reason why the Fourth Armour kept the uh, the reserve command this far back. And as the situation with the hospitals started to uh, improve, so more hospitals were brought uh, uh, towards the north, they uh, started moving this uh, this reserve medical company uh, uh, and, and they brought it up north uh, up north as well. Um, now you might think that if you're this far south, you, they had an easy time of it, and the next uh, uh, message shows that it's absolutely not true. Here we can see Lieutenant Colonel Robert Mayard, which is the commanding officer of the 46th. He is uh, messaging his uh, or sending this message to his two frontline uh, medical companies, Company A and B, on the 26th, and the, the, the timestamp is 1835, and it reads: "Send no, repeat no casualties to Company C." until notified none but genuine casualties will be evacuated so c companies see swamped as well uh, especially with the combat exhaustion cases that they are that they are dealing with um, and which is the reference to the, the genuine casualties um, it, it, it means that only the you know the true severe bell casualties are still uh, being evacuated uh, at that point and as we can understand and as we have discussed the system only works if everything is you know keeps on moving and so Company A, uh, within 45 minutes, is replying with regards to your message of 1835, what shall I do with the combat exhaustion case of the CE? Um, and in total, um, sort of uh, uh, contrary to a fourth armored policy, they received the following reply, which reads, uh, regarding your message of 2015, evacuate them to the hospitals until notified otherwise. So they are so swamped with the combat exhaustion cases that they are left no other choice but to evacuate them to hospitals, running the risk of you know, draining the division of these experienced men who might end up in the replacement depot or system. Um, but again, so again a real reference to what one of the stories of the Ardennes. I mean, that is the image so many of the viewers will have of the you know, Band of Brothers and the war film was of even that film, the Burt Lancaster film, Castle Keep, these kind of guys wandering back from the front who have, have been to hell and back, you know, it, battle fatigue, combat fatigue, whatever you want to call it, combat exhaustion cases were absolutely through the roof in those first few days of the Ardennes campaign. So, you know, you've it, whether they wanted to deal with the problem or not, it is a very real problem that they're going to have to address. Oh, they, they really wanted to uh, to uh, address this problem, as I said, because they wanted these men back at the they front. Them back. Yeah, they want to they, treat them and bring them back. Them yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, um, and so, and then this is uh, uh, another uh, page taken from the Division Surgeon's uh, Journal, and here we can see the 4th of December 26th, the 4th Armoured uh, reported 172 wounded and 85 combat exhaustion cases, 167 wounded and 73 combat exhaustion cases were evacuated. Now, it, it's important to know that these 73 are not necessarily uh, coming from the same 85 uh, combat exhaustion cases who were reported this day. They might simply be men who were um, uh, treated for 48 hours, who were sedated for 48 hours, and then the division psychiatrist simply found that they were not uh, capable of returning to duty, and then he had, was left no choice but to evacuate them to make right, room okay. for, more, for more cases. Uh, and the bottom there, we can see that they reported 35 cases of frostbite in the 4th Army Division that date. No longer trench foot because the, the temperature were freezing, uh, below freezing point, and so the medical term changed from uh, trench foot to frostbite. And this is probably uh, uh, a lower uh, number than was, uh, was realistic because what was found is that many of the combat exhaustion cases were also suffering from trench foot. And so probably uh, suffering from trench foot uh, aggravated or, or uh, sort of made them more susceptible to become combat exhaustion mm -hmm. uh, casualties. And in that case, they were reported as combat exhaustion. So. Um, there's a, a clear under uh, uh, underestimation or, or under report, if you like, for uh, for the uh, the frostbite cases. Brilliant analysis now, there. Yeah, we can also see that the clearing stations treated 81 prisoners of war that day, and uh, you, the the division suffered a total of 24 uh, com uh, killed in action uh, that day, and one of them we can see in the next slide was a medic. We can see at the bottom here of this morning report for the medical detachment of the 51st Armored Infantry Battalion that Private Robert A, I think his name is pronounced Traub, I think, 
uh, was killed in action on December 26th. Um, he was one of a total of five medics of the 4th Armored who was killed during the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, the second one we can see the, the below, uh, Private Straub, which is PFC Martin J. Favors, who was killed on December 28th. And the next slide shows the, uh, the other three, Private William King, who, was, uh, who died of wounds December 25th. Now, some of you might wonder what's the difference between being killed in action and dying of wounds. It simply means if you uh, have died before you reach a medical installation, you are killed in action. If you die after you have reached a medical installation, you have died of wounds. Um, Private Paul V. Madsen was killed on December 27th, and Tech 4 Oliver Pincombe was killed on January 3rd. And on the morning report, we can see that uh, Tech 4 Oliver Pincombe, he's in the top row of the morning, of the morning report, only uh, was attached to this medical detachment on December 30th. So wow. he, uh, he served with this uh, unit for only four days before he was killed in action. Wow. And so and the statistics up... you promised us, and uh, yeah, yeah we, we, we like a nice little uh, summary of statistics. It's always uh, good for the data geeks out there. Yeah, um, I do have to disappoint you just a little bit, Paul, um, because it is extremely difficult to come up with the definitive numbers for the Battle of the Bulge, and I'll try to explain a few factors that uh, uh, that play uh, into this. Um, different medical installations report different cases on different times. It, it sounds really stupid, but if, for instance, someone is treated at a battalion aid station and then returned to duty, but his wounds start bleeding again and he returns to the battalion aid station, they will report someone uh, a new casualty. Uh, so the same person is, is reported twice. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you have frostbite symptoms and you are a combat exhaustion case, you are reported as a combat exhaustion case. Um, and uh, the medical companies would report at a certain particular time uh, during the day how many casualties they would have at that particular moment. So they are not reporting uh, who went through the day. So it, it is really difficult to come up. And so the best that I could do was to show you these two uh, reports from the uh, Battalion S3, showing us the total numbers of casualties treated by the 46th Armored Medical Battalion for the entire month of December and January which means that it also includes the first week of December, which is the end of the Lorraine campaign. So these numbers uh, are uh, higher than what was probably, uh, they probably uh, um, treated during the Battle of the Bulge. But even when you look at the, this for the medical battalion and you look at the after action report for the division, um, they, will, uh, they will show different numbers for these, for these months. So it's, it's, um, it is really difficult to come up with uh, any definitive numbers. But just to give us an idea, we can see that for the 4th Armored, in both battle and non-battle casualties, they have treated about 3,000 men uh, in these uh, two months. And realistically, in about six weeks, because uh, the division took another resting period uh, after uh, January 13th, uh, 1945. We can also see that they have treated uh, 164 POWs. They have treated other US and allied battle casualties and they have treated uh, about uh, 26 uh, civilians uh, during these months. So overall, uh, very impressive numbers for, you know, what really is quite a small medical um, uh, medical staff for a division. Wow. And and what, I mean, and there's your last slide with your contact. Absolutely. Your yeah, website. thank you for... And again, the description is in, the, the, the link is in the description below, but um, what was this arguably the, the worst period for the 4th Armour Division Medical Units? Did things get better or worse in the last sort of four months of the war after this? Um, I would say that after they, uh, they uh, received another resting period in the south of Luxembourg um, in the second half of January and, and part of February, I think things really started to look up for the for the division. Um, the the campaigns, although brutal, uh, to reach the Rhine um, in uh, March '45, and then to race across the uh, um, what's now called the Hunsrück towards uh, the, the Rhine crossing at uh, at Nierstein and and, and Oppenheim. Um, it was. Uh, it, the, the, what, what happened is that the division started moving as an armored division again. Mm -hmm. So the, the, it was really like racing across France again. So the, the, it was the happy time for an armored division because they could 
use what what General Wood uh, had learned him uh, had, had taught him about you know quick moving, get behind an enemy uh, uh, pocket of resistance because they will start you know uh, surrendering quickly after they you know found out that there's a, an armored unit behind. Um, yeah. Uh, behind you, and and so that's that's really what what was going on. It goes to what we were saying earlier about later in the war. It's about them in being part of operations they are controlling, as opposed to the Ardennes. It's a situation they're reacting to, where the Germans are in a sense controlling it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, brilliant stuff. And what can I say? I mean, uh, we've had plenty of requests for you to come back and do some more shows with us. So people say, does he know about other units? Well, we can we can only ask yeah. you, can't we? Do you know about other units? Uh, no, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, the, 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 the real uh, advantage of focusing on one unit is that you can really dive in deep. Yeah. And it, it, uh, you know, it really gives you a chance to get the, the best understanding possible of what, what, what's going on. Um, and the, the, sort of the lessons learned or, or the experiences of the 4th Army Division do translate to what was happening on in, uh, in, in the U.S. Army. So, for instance, the, the blood plasma and, and, and whole blood situation, the, the treatment of trench food and, and frostbite, uh, all those things, they do tie in with, uh, with the experiences of the U.S. Army. And so, uh, from a general, you know, generally speaking, those experiences do transfer into to sort of a broader discussion. So. Yeah, if you if you'll have no, me back, you more, than, just, more than glad to. Just to add, it's often when you're reading a book, and we talked about Peter Caddick Adams' superb book and other books, you know, Don Fox's books, is that because they're trying to cover an entire operation, there's only so much detail you can put in. So often it'll be a, it'll be a line like "and casualties were evacuated" without really having the time and the space to explain how that process would be done, and that we like would then we need a sort of specialist book to explain that process. But you've done wonderfully tonight explaining what that process is and effectively how and well how effective it was by this point of the war despite the trying conditions despite the weather despite it being the german offensive how how reasonably efficient the whole thing was absolutely no well brilliant so i'll just remind people what we are coming up and i'll come and say goodbye in a second so folks the third part of our trio of shows this week is tomorrow evening with steve steve zaloga that's 7 p.m uk time talking about his book smashing the panzers then a bit of a break for New Year. Then we have the shows again with Nina Jans, Dr. Nina, Nina Jans, talking about the casualties and how they were buried after the Ardennes, Peter Caddick, Adam summing up. And I've just rescheduled again the show about the British in the Battle of Bulge. Jonathan Ware is back. He's had personal issues to deal with. So that'll be, uh, I think we said January the 8th for that. So that'll be coming after the Battle of Bulge. And then, by the way, folks, I'm taking a kind of a two-week break from World War II TV for some things. I'm redesigning my set in my office space uh, I'm recording some guest spots and some other podcasts. I'm taking a bit of a break from things so I can come back fully with a whole lot of shows towards the end of January. And I've got some amazing shows coming at you. Uh, as usual, I must remind you, you that this week, a series of shows is sponsored by Battle of Maps US. The link is in the description below. If you go to the website and see their maps and charts and and, and, and prints, you get a 20% discount if you use the World War II TV promo code. Uh, We've got the links to Renier's website, his Facebook, oh, his Facebook page, his Twitter account. Follow that. Please share what we're doing on social media. If you haven't become a patron yet, please consider throwing a few dollars our way every month. It may, means I can commit to this for another 12 months and keep on going and bring you this stuff. But right now, it just remains me to say thank you very much to our guest. I really, really learned a lot today, and so did everybody else. So you've broken your duck to use an expression on World War II TV. We'll be happy to have you come back at some point in the future. Did you enjoy it? Absolutely, and I would be honoured to uh, to come back. Absolutely, we will definitely have you back. So there we are, folks. I'm going to say good evening. So this is Paul Woodard for World War Two TV, saying I will see you all again tomorrow. And I have had a fantastic uh, education experience today, and I'm sure you have too. Cheers, everybody. Have a good rest of the day. <laughs>